It's June 27th here in Seoul and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour. Starting with North Korea's persistent sending of waste-carrying balloons. The North flew more of those balloons on Wednesday night for the third day in a row. The regime also claimed its missile test on Wednesday was aimed at securing multiple warhead missile capability and was successful. Identities of 11 more victims out of the 23 that died in the deadly battery plant fire have been newly confirmed. Police and the labor ministry raided the facility as a part of a probe over the accident. Armed soldiers and vehicles stormed into Bolivia's presidential palace in what appeared to be a failed coup attempt. Bolivian president called on the armed forces to demobilize immediately, dismissing Army General Commander Juan Jose Suniga, who appears to have led Wednesday's move. North Korea announced hours ago that its ballistic missile launch on Wednesday was successful in testing its capability to develop missiles carrying multiple warheads. And the North also sent more trash carrying balloons overnight. Our PNZ reports. At around 5.30 a.m. on Wednesday morning, a white trail of smoke was seen in South Korea's capital area, apparently from a ballistic missile tested by North Korea. South Korea's military said the missile was fired from the Pyongyang area, but explained that the North had failed, as the missile exploded mid-air after traveling some 250 kilometers. The military said it appeared to have been the North's attempt to test launch a hypersonic missile, and added that it would conduct further analysis of the launch alongside the U.S. But North Korea on Thursday claimed that its missile launch the day before was a successful test aimed at developing missiles carrying multiple warheads. Its state-run media said the separated warheads were guided correctly to three coordinated targets and said the latest test was to secure the capability to fire multiple warheads on a single ballistic missile. It added that the test was carried out within a 170 to 200 kilometer radius, using the first stage engine of an intermediate range solid fuel ballistic missile. This follows the North's launching of more trash carrying balloons on Wednesday night for the third day in a row. This was the seventh balloon launch in the past month by the regime. Announcing that the North has again floated another round of waste carrying balloons, South Korea's military advised the public to report the balloons if spotted and refrain from touching them. To better address these threats from North Korea, South Korea on Wednesday resumed live fire drills on its western border islands for the first time in nearly seven years. The country's Marine Corps fired around 290 artillery shells using its K-9 howitzers and Tomo multiple rocket launcher systems. This was the first such exercise after the country's decision earlier this month to suspend the inter-Korean military agreement, which bans hostile activities including live fire drills near the border. Pounds, Arirang News. During a meeting with South Korea's top envoy to Russia, a senior Russian diplomat called on South Korea to reconsider what he called a confrontational policy that could escalate tensions on the Korean Peninsula. According to Russia's top uh, state media outlet, Taz on Wednesday, Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister Andrei Brudenko made the remarks during talks with South Korean Ambassador Lee Do-hun amid rising tensions between the two countries after a visit to Pyongyang by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Citing a press release from the Russian Foreign Ministry, Rudenko called on Saar to find effective ways to achieve reconciliation, peace and stability in Northeast Asia. The ministry also slammed recent remarks by senior Saar officials on military cooperation between Moscow and Pyongyang. Eleven more victims from the fire this week at a battery factory here in South Korea have been identified, with nine remaining to be confirmed. And all the victims are presumed to have died from suffocation. Our An Song Jin has the latest. Search and seizure procedures have concluded after seven hours at the lithium battery factory, which was the site of Monday's deadly fire, as well as at a related labor office. This comes as part of the police and the Ministry of Employment and Labor's investigation to identify the cause of the fire and those responsible. Earlier this week, five people were charged with violations of industrial laws over the fire. As the investigation into the deadly blaze at a lithium battery plant in Hwasong City, Gyeonggi-do province continues, 
the identities of the victims are still being confirmed. On Wednesday afternoon, 11 more bodies have been identified. The Gyeonggi Nambu Provincial Police, in coordination with the National Forensic Service, confirmed DNA results and notified the families, including the families of foreign nationals. The 11 victims identified on Wednesday afternoon include nine Chinese nationals, one Korean and one from Laos, which leaves 14 people identified so far. DNA testing continues for the rest of the victims. As the National Forensic Service continues its autopsy, it has tentatively concluded that all of the victims suffocated. The government will continue its investigation as it turns out that the fire department had already warned about the danger of a fire due to rapid expansion of combustion, three months before the tragedy. Further allegations were made that the company didn't follow proper procedures when hiring foreign workers at the factory. The fire, which broke out on Monday after a series of explosions at a battery cell storage area, has left 23 dead and 8 injured. An Song Jin, Arirang News. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan held their first inaugural industry ministerial meeting on Wednesday to seek ways to boost trilateral cooperation on supply chains and economic security. Now, what can the three sides get from each other? We're joined by Professor Yang Yidong this morning. Welcome back, Professor Yang. Hello, good morning. Let's talk about the timing of the trilateral discussion. I mean, what makes them think that it's necessary to hold such a meeting now? Well, in terms of the timing, you can think about a couple of events. The first, last year in August, there, was, uh, there were three uh, president uh, summit meeting in Camp David, and mm -hmm. they agreed to uh, hold a regular uh, industry minister's meeting, uh, and they create a new agenda through the meeting. And second, uh, the trigger in terms of the timing is uh, G7 leaders submitted uh, in this month, and they agreed to uh, strengthen and enhance the very uh, resilient and reliable supply chains in many different aspects for the sake of uh, very secure international economics. So those are major drivers for this meeting. But uh, I can think about the two major, very tangible and uh, real uh, drivers behind this meeting. The first one is they want to acquire very reliable and resilient supply chains in three aspects, semiconductors, oil minerals, and clean energy. And second one is they want to control, very tightly control over advanced technology, particularly for the semiconductors. So these are the major, major economic uh, drivers behind this uh, the industry uh, minister's meeting. So the timing of their trial order discussion can't be more appropriate. Now, it's the U.S. and Japan that South Korea is working on. Now, what makes the two sides, you know, attractive partners for us hard to collaborate with in uh, securing supply chains and also economic security? Well, we can think about the two major reasons behind this uh, three uh, tripartite meeting. The first one is they want to control over the China's uh, influence in the global politics and economy. Uh, and the, the, one of the major strong evidence behind this uh, you know, the incentive is they declare that they want to, they do share the common values mm. in favor of liberty and human rights and law. And the, those three major principles are pretty much opposite to uh, country mechanism of China. And the second major uh, the liaison that the tide of those three countries is, again, uh, they want to keep alignment with the principles announced by a G7 meeting uh, leader's uh, statement. So they want to uh, strengthen and acquire very reliable and resilient supply chains. And uh, through this industry minister's meeting, they have uh, come up with a very detailed agenda. They have uh, helped materialize and realize the very vague value systems proposed by uh, G7 leaders' meeting. So common values and interests that are putting the three sides uh, uh, together this time. Now, what is there for South Korea for us to offer? And in what way could it possibly lead the trilateral cooperation in supply chain and trade? Well, the first of all, Korea is one of the very leading countries in semiconductors. Now, the same size of semiconductors is about uh, $600 billion, even though the, the, there are many different uh, you know, the, uh, subdivisions. And uh, Korea has uh, competed uh, very, uh, you know, seriously and very fiercely against the, uh, the United States and China and Japan. And now China wants to take over their leaderships in the semiconductors that have threatened the national security of the United States and also Japan. So that is one of the major reasons why the United States has invited Korea and Japan to uh, you know, uh, take part in this tripartite meeting. The second one is Korea also has a very strong leadership in the uh, 
carbon neutrality. Mm. The carbon neutrality was the vision proposed by Paris Agreement in 2015. And everyone knows that uh, by 2050, all this world will live in the net zero, in other words, carbon-free economy. And uh, yes, an IPEF proposed by uh, President Biden about a couple of years ago, and Korea has come up with a very detailed agenda for this IPEF that has uh, that cons uh, consisted of 14 Asian countries, including Japan. So these are the major reasons why Korea has come up with the strong leadership with this tripartite uh, industry minister's meeting. Definitely. And also in a separate meeting, Seoul and Tokyo agreed to newly launch this working group on a cooperation in the supply chain for clean hydrogen and ammonia. Let's talk about that. Well, the, f the major reason why the, uh, you know, the uh, special meetings with those two countries is very important is we should keep in mind that the Japan and Korea have a very similar infrastructure and also the energy consumption patterns. In other words, if we have a problem, you mean occur in raw materials, in core minerals, the same problem will occur in Japan as well. So both of Japan and Korea may share, may have shared very serious concerns about the China's restrictive control and also their ban on the export of uh, the gallium and germanium announced by uh, in uh, August last year. And also they try to declare they're going to control the export of uh, the graphite. Uh, in December. Those materials are very key core material ingredients for semiconductors. So, I mean, Japan and Korea may need to you know, collaborate and cooperate very, very fiercely to release all these risk to control over core min uh, minerals, particularly for the semiconductors. And besides, both Japan and Korea have agreed on the principles of uh, carbon neutrality, as I already mentioned. Mm -hmm. And they have pronounced very detailed plans, so-called the uh, NDC, uh, National Determined Contributions, that have uh, provided the visions to control their carbon uh, emissions. For example, Korea will reduce their carbon emissions by 40% compared to uh, 2018 until 2030. Mm. In Japan, also declared they want to reduce carbon emissions by 46% until 2030. Uh, compared to uh, 2013. So in many different aspects, we can you know, very clearly confirm that both Japan and the Korea have come with lots of commonality in their future visions, particularly in their pure economies and the future industrial uh, and also the international politics uh, phenomena, situations. Right, from consumption to goals to achieve. Now, uh, Professor Yang, before I let you go, you briefly touched upon this. The U.S. has been asking Seoul and Tokyo to join its efforts to you know, infor in enforce export control measures to block China's access to advanced chip industry, technology, and AI. The question is, will South Korea and Tokyo join the U.S.? Well, overall, I do believe that both Korea and Japan will join the efforts, these efforts of the United States. But in terms of uh, severity, I think the Korea may have come up with different attitudes against mm. uh, Japan because even though the Korean companies have uh, taken over major market shares in semiconductors, when it comes to uh, semiconductor producing equipment, Korean companies are taking over very small portions in the global market, less than uh, about the three percent. So that's why, and again, our minister of industry, in industries have declared that, uh, well, we may be very hesitant uh, not to export our the uh, semiconductor the, the equipments to uh, China. So uh, Japan and Korean principle may share these same concerns and principles of the United States, but when it comes to the very detailed agenda, Korea may be a little hesitant than uh, Japan to join the uh, United States to control every you know, aspects of advanced technology to, to China. All right, Professor Yang, it was a pleasure to have you with us today. We appreciate it, as always. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Having the highest suicide rate among OECD member nations could be just one of the indicators that shows South Koreans are not happy. The government has now placed looking after people's mental health as one of its top priorities. Our Kim Do-yeon reports. 
A series of policies dedicated to the mental health of citizens was announced on Wednesday after President Yoon Suk-yeol became the first South Korean leader to chair a meeting specifically dedicated to the mental well-being of the people. Hosting the first meeting of a committee he created last year, Yoon vowed a complete shift in the government's approach to mental health. The committee is tasked with focusing on three areas, prevention, treatment and recovery. Regarding prevention, the government is set to start a project that will provide mental counseling to a million people by 2027, while providing free mental health checkups every two years for those in their 20s and 30s instead of once every 10 years. To promote rapid treatment, it will expand the current mental health emergency response teams nationwide. For recovery, the government will create rehabilitation centers focused on mental illnesses. The detailed mental health policy plans announced during today's meeting are a roadmap created through surveys of patients and their families and input from medical, psychiatry, counseling and welfare experts. No other government has ever done this before. In the meantime, President Yoon said changing the public's perception of mental health is even more important than the policies themselves. An official at the presidential office said the committee will have subcommittees and one of them will consist of marketing and PR experts to create campaigns on breaking down the barriers of public perception toward mental health. Kim Do-yeon, Arirang News. Starting today, medical professors at Severance Hospital, one of the big five major hospitals in South Korea, have decided to go on an indefinite strike in protest against the government's medical school quota expansion. Announcing this on Wednesday, the hospital's emergency committee said professors will have the option to choose whether or not to join the walkout. But it did add that treatment in essential areas, such as the emergency room, the intensive care unit, and child delivery room, will not be affected by the strike. Professors at Asan Medical Center have also said they plan on joining the walkout starting next Thursday. But medical professors at other major hospitals, such as Seoul National University, Catholic University and Samsung Medical Center have said they won't stage a walkout for now to minimize a medical disruption. We're less than a month away from the start of the Paris Olympics, and Team Korea is working hard to make sure athletes are ready to push for medals. Our Choi soo visited their training center. South Korea's athletes' faces were filled with excitement and anticipation. In the upcoming 2024 Paris Olympics this summer, around 10,500 athletes from 206 countries will compete in 32 sports. Team Korea will comprise slightly over 140 athletes to participate in 21 sports, its smallest delegation since the 50 at the 1976 Montreal Olympics. At the recent 2020 Tokyo Summer Olympics three years ago, South Korea won a total of 20 medals, including six gold, four silver and ten bronze, finishing in the top 15 overall rankings. Here at the National Training Center in Jincheon, Chungcheongbuk-do province, Team Korea is training hard in the final preparations for the Olympics before heading to Paris with the goal of winning five gold medals and securing a place in the top 15 overall rankings. In archery, Korea claimed four gold medals in Tokyo and expect to get good result in Paris. In Tokyo, there were no spectators due to COVID-19. But the Paris Olympics are expected to be filled with many fans. We are very excited and have been preparing a lot, so we ask for strong support. 
My goal is to win a gold medal in the men's team event. Swimmer Huang Sonu, who won six medals, including two goals, at the 2023 Asian Games in Hangzhou, showed his confidence. Over the past three years, we have honed our skills and gained valuable experience, and we are determined to show the country excellent performances. Weightlifter Park Kejong aims for a medal in the discipline for Team Korea for the first time in 16 years since the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Since it's my first Olympics, I feel very nervous, but I'm also eager to go to Paris quickly, although my goal is not necessarily a gold medal. I am working hard with my coach to ensure I at least make it into the medal podium. Badminton star An Seyang also said that she will deliver her best performance to the nation in Paris. Earlier this year, I was constantly worried and had a tough time due to injuries. However, now that I am focusing on the Olympics, my condition has improved significantly. I can do prepare well. I believe I can achieve good results. Meanwhile, following concerns about the extreme heat in Paris at the end of July, the Korean Sport and Olympic Committee has pledged to support the athletes in every way, including providing cooling jackets to ensure they can do their best. Regardless of the color or number of medals, the Paris Summer Olympics, which will bring great joy and excitement to the nation, will begin a 17-day journey on July 26. Choi Soo-hyung, Arirang News, Jincheon. Good morning, I'm Kim Xiang, and now we turn to stories from around the world. We begin today in Bolivia, where the country's armed forces surrounded key government buildings in the country's capital, La Paz, on Wednesday. After almost a full day of the attempted coup, which saw condemnation from domestic and international communities, soldiers were seen beginning to withdraw from the area. Bolivian citizens gathered in the vicinity of the presidential palace to demonstrate against the army's presence in the city center as armored vehicles rammed into the palace earlier the same day. A dramatic scene captured on Bolivian television showed Bolivia's president, Luis Arce, confronting troops in the palace hallway, saying, I am your captain and I order you to withdraw your soldiers. Arte denounced the armed forces' actions and sacked the army's general commander, Juan José Zuniga, who was allegedly behind the coup attempt. Earlier, Zuniga had told reporters that three army chiefs had come together to take action due to an economic crisis in the country, saying he had public support. The newly appointed army chief, José Wilson Sanchez, ordered all mobilized armed forces to return to base. <clears throat> Moving over to Kenya, the country's president, William Ruto, announced on Wednesday that he will not sign a controversial finance bill following mass protests across the country that have left at least 23 people dead. In a televised address Wednesday, Ruto confirmed that he had decided not to sign the 2024 finance bill as the people had spoken. This comes ahead of the One Million People March planned for Thursday, which the Kenyan protesters say will still take place despite Ruto scrapping the bill. The budget bill was passed by Parliament on Tuesday, despite widespread opposition to tax increases it included. Parliament buildings were set alight on the same day, while there were also violent clashes between the protesters and the police nationwide. American journalist Evan Gershkovich, who is the first U.S. reporter to be re arrested on espionage charges in Russia since the Cold War, went on trial on Wednesday in Yekaterinburg, some 15 months after first being locked up in a Moscow jail. The Wall Street Journal reporter was seen stood in a metal and glass cage in a Russian courtroom with his head shaven, smiling to the cameras before the trial was held behind closed doors. Russian prosecutors claimed that Gershkovich was collecting classified information about a Yekaterinburg-based Russian tank manufacturer on behalf of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Gershkovich, the Wall Street Journal and the U.S. government strongly rejected the charge, with the White House saying that Russia is using the journalists as a bargaining chip. Gershkovich faces up to 20 years in prison if convicted. 
as sweltering temperatures in Washington, D.C. rose to some 37 degrees Celsius over the past few days, a wax statue of Abraham Lincoln partially melted, causing its head to fall off. The 1.8-meter-high wax statue had been placed outside Garrison Elementary School, which is on the site of Camp Barker, a Civil War-era refugee camp. The statue, which is also a functioning candle, was part of the Wax Monument series by Virginia-based artist Sandy Williams IV, which creates wax replicas of popular public monuments and cultural icons. The head from the wax sculpture is now under repair. Good morning. Have an umbrella handy if you're in the southern parts of Korea. Right now, wet clouds are passing over Jeju, dropping 30 millimeters an hour of heavy monsoon showers, which will gradually spread to the rest of south as the morning goes on. Further south, we'll see heavier showers, and until Friday morning, most of Jeju could see up to 100 millimeters of monsoon rain. And the rest of the southern provinces could see 5 to 60 millimeters. Meanwhile, it's going to be another scorcher under burning sunshine in central regions, with temperatures going up as high as yesterday. So Seoul and Daejeon could go up to 32 degrees, but certain parts will have 1 to 7 degrees, lower daytime highs, topping out at 25 degrees in Busan and Jeju. Now, tomorrow looks to be hotter in the capital, while monsoon season starts this weekend in central regions. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching Yudayed Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow for our Friday's edition at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.